The story of Charlotte is a family story, but it's not my family story. A few years ago, I did a program for the Christchurch Libraries, and at the end, a woman came up to me and told me about her grandmother, who worked in the mines and had to smoke cigarettes because the doctor said so. And at the time, I was looking for a story to link the story of the woman's vote in 1893 to the experience of Mabel Howard as a member of parliament. And that story went in very nicely because Mabel Howard, of course, got her proficiency in 1906. So once, and it seemed to me that we make a lot of fuss about the woman's vote, but the Education Act is just as important. Well, you do get stories from other people, and about 10 years ago, I did some storytelling in an Oxford retirement home, and at the end of it, a very old lady came up to me, and she told me this story. Now, I've no way of checking it. I don't even know the proper spelling or the pronunciation of the names, but I like the story. Archu was an old man. He was an old man without a pension because in, he was a foreigner. And foreigners didn't qualify for pensions in 1910. Every Sunday morning, when the church bells began to ring, he would go out into his vegetable garden and he would cut his very best vegetables, a carrot, some cabbage, uh, maybe some radishes, and he'd arrange them all beautifully on a bed of silver beet. And he'd put on his hat and his long black coat with his queue hanging down his back and he would walk through the village, walking quickly on the shady side of the street. And if you asked him, he would tell you that he was walking through the town at this time on a Sunday because this was when the Ballydellicans were at church and he could walk through the streets unmolested because R2 was made quite miserable by the belly lavicans. They would trip him up, they would pull his pigtail, they would throw stones at him. And strangely, no one ever stopped them. No one, their friends just cheered them on. Their parents, their mothers would tut tut a bit, but they smile indulgently because boys will be boys. And the police would look the other way. And Archu just kept to himself all the week because of the belly relicans. And on Sundays he went to visit Tom and Mavis. Now most of the village agreed that Tom and Mavis were a little odd. Tom was a minor, he married a much younger woman, and they had a daughter called Maud, who was just eight years old. And Archu would knock formally on the door, and little Maud would open it shyly, and Archu would call her Miss Maud, and she would giggle. And then Tom and Mavis would come, and Archu would say, I wish you very good morning. I bring very poor cabbage, very bad carrots, very sad radish from my poor garden. And Mavis, who had very good Chinese manners, would say, what a beautiful cabbage, what lovely carrots, what fine radishes. Archu, thank you. You must stay for dinner. And Archer would stay and eat roast hobbit with potatoes, pumpkin, gravy, and cabbage cooked the English way. He would stay all day, telling stories, playing cards, drinking tea. And when six o'clock came, he would eat bread and butter, cold meat and lettuce and tomatoes. And when darkness fell, he would creep home along the village street, unseen by the belly lelicans. I have only three friends in the world, said Archu. But once he had had a hundred. Once there had been a hundred Chinese miners in a shanty town, and he had friends to drink tea with and talk and gamble, sometimes to smoke. And the belly lelicans were no trouble at all, for the Chinese men could stick together and protect each other. And they were young. There were no women no children to make them vulnerable. And they'd moved and, um, but now the others were gone. They died, there was no one, they'd gone on back to China. There was no one to talk about China now. No one who remembered what it was like to live in a village. <laughs>
A long time ago, Ah Chu had lived in a village in China. He'd been a young man with a beautiful wife, a beautiful wife who had cost him all the money he had, and he was in debt. But he worked hard, and he did his duty. And in China, he had often been hungry. Sometimes he had been afraid, but he had never been alone. He had his family, his wife, his son, his village. But the agent had come looking for indentured workers for Australia, and he had known that it was his duty to go. There was hunger in the village. He could go for just five years. He could send money home. His mother and his wife would not be hungry, and all he had to do was save money and return, and then he would buy a house. Maybe he would buy a field. So he gave his wife to his mother to keep, and left, knowing that they would wait in the village until he returned. Well, he was not alone even then. There were eight young men from the village, including older cousin. The men were separated in Australia, but older cousin and Archu stayed together, and they planted vegetables, herbs, and poppies, and worked in the cookhouse to feed men who seemed to have no family and no village, and who seemed to live for work and whiskey. But every month he sent money home to keep his wife, his son, and his mother. And for every Australian pound, his wife received three tala. You could buy a lot of rice for three tala. And five years passed. And at the end of five years, Archu had 12 Australian pounds for the fare to China. And he had 20 pounds saving. He would buy a house, almost, with 20 pounds. He and elder cousin set out for Melbourne. But when they got to Melbourne, it seemed kind of a pity to leave Australia without trying some of its pleasures. They had tasted the dust and the dry and the work and the loneliness, then the roughness of men who had no village. So just for once, they would taste food in Chinatown, proper food, and whiskey and pleasure. Well, two days later, Archu and older cousin had no 20 pounds and no 12 pounds for the trip to China. They had no work, they had no money, and they had nowhere to go. So they followed some other Chinese to the gold fields. And in 1865, the Otago Provincial Council sent an invitation to the Chinese in Australia to come and work in the Otago gold fields. They thought too much gold is being missed by the other miners. They wanted the Chinese to work on the tailings to find the gold that the other miners missed. So our two went with the other Chinese miners. And they worked together like men who come from villages can. They dug the dirt for the cradles, they set up sluices, they washed out all the old tailings. And the other miners left them alone. They lived in their own shanty towns, planting herbs and vegetables, berries and poppies. They had their own Chinese hotel and stores where they could buy rice and spices. And in the evenings they cooked pork and vegetables and rice. And sometimes they smoked opium. Sometimes they gambled. But most days they found a little gold dust. Well, one day, they he and older cousin had both saved 100 pounds and the fair back to China. But they thought they wouldn't go together. First, older cousin would go. He would return to the village. He'd been away 10 years. But now, now his wife would still be young enough to give him a son. And Archie would wait until older cousin had been. And he would write and he would tell Archie what was going on. And so older cousin left, but he didn't write. Within the year he returned, because his wife was dead. Bandits had come, they'd stolen his money, they'd burnt his house, they'd taken his winter store of rice, and the village had been full of fever, and Archu's mother, his wife, his son were all dead. So Archu and older cousin just stayed on in the gold fields. One by one, the other Chinese men went back to China, or they died, leaving money 
to, to send their bones back to the village so they could rest. Achu and older cousin bought themselves a field in Waikaka. They built themselves a two-roomed hut. They planted vegetables and sold them. And some people said they were rich, that there was gold dust hidden under the floor. Tom called on them, and he invited them to dinner. But after many years, Achu's older cousin died and was buried in the graveyard. Achu painted his Chinese name on the wooden tombstone. And then there was only he was the last Chinese in Waikaka. And then Tom died. Achu went to the funeral. Even the belly lelicans respected a funeral. And on the Sunday after the funeral, he filled his basket with vegetables and visited Mavis. Very sorry, he said. Tom, very good friend. Now I have only two friends in the world. I bring you very poor cauliflower, very bad beans, very sad pumpkin. What a beautiful cauliflower, said Mavis. What fine beans. What a magnificent pumpkin. You must stay to dinner, Archer. Tom would like that. Well, Monday morning. Mavis's friends came to see her. There was no need to be tactful. What they were saying was so obvious. Now that you're a widower, they said, you can't have a Chinaman hanging around. You have to think of yourself. You, what will do people think? Think about your friends. Think about it. And Mavis thought about it. And she was almost persuaded. But when Archu turned up the next Sunday with his basket of vegetables, she couldn't send him into the road where he would be at the mercy of the belly lelicans. Tom would not have liked that. And so it went on, Sunday after Sunday, until finally Archu died and was buried in Waikaka. Mavis and little Maud were the only people at his funeral. The belly lelicans broke down his hut and they dug up the floor, but they didn't find any gold. But there was no one to paint his Chinese name on his wooden tombstone. And he might have been forgotten. He might have been totally forgotten if an old woman in a rest home in Oxford, in Canterbury, hadn't told me the story. And her name was Maud. Oh.